So at this point, if you've been able to write this code properly so far, you get something like this. We've got this top area, footer, main content. Uh, we had a page two a moment ago. It still exists, but now we need a way for us to link or click on a link to go to page two. <coughs> so we'll get back to our code. Okay, so section, our first section here of page one, uh, we've got our article of main content, footer. After main content, let's say uh, we're going to create a new paragraph, and then we're going to say go to page two. We're going to say that we're going to click go to page two and it'll go to page two which is a completely different section we're gonna use a plain old link so the a tag we're gonna wrap the a tag uh, around this and we're gonna see several times that if you know the plain old HTML all you really then need to know is like the little bit of secrets to upgrade that via jQuery mobile. We had data role page and it created a new page and we had data role header and so forth. So we have these various data roles that we just need to learn before that. This is going to link over to href. It's going to go somewhere. Right? This is a link. I want it to go over to page two. Well, we've got a section called data role page and we've got another section called data role page technically there's no way to uniquely identify them we need some sort of way to uniquely identify them so that we can go from section one to section two uniquely identify them we need an ID for every section that we wish to then identify and move on to so let's back up to our first section here and give it an ID Hey, we used IDs on Tuesday when we dealt with JavaScript, when we dealt with the form and the input fields. This comes up again here. We need to uniquely identify these things. So an ID, I'll call this PG Home. Let's say this is our home screen. This, obviously, we can make it up however we want. It could be called page one. We could do it very obviously. But let's say that ultimately this is going to be our home screen. So we need another unique identifier for our second page. So you'll see here section, our second section, which we haven't done any of the upgrades yet. We'll do that in a moment. Let's simply add an ID of PG uh, about. Let's say the stuff in here was our about screen. PG for page or screen or whatever you want to call these. So every section needs a unique ID. That'd be good to write a note over here. Every section should have a unique ID. Only one section per HTML file may have the same ID. And I wrote it in capital reasons because it might be important. So I cannot name anything else in my single page app PG Home. Makes sense. If I click a button to go home and I have three things named home, which is the right home? Only one thing is home, one thing is about, one thing is save comic, one thing is log out. So every screen full of content is a section, and every section should have a unique ID. And these IDs are whatever we want to call them, whatever naming scheme you want. PG underscore start, or, you know, S1 home whatever you want to call these things with an ID is valid as long as only one section has that ID knowing this our href is going to be pound PG about the pound sign we do not write the pound sign in the ID attribute but we have to write the pound sign in the href attribute. Uh, plain old link 
to jump to a section with an ID of PG about. No pound sign when it's ID, yes pound sign when it's an href. You can sort of think about it as the pound sign is sort of the nickname for ID. And when we cover CSS and JavaScript, uh, those pound signs are very, very, very important. <coughs> is a plain old ID in, Java, in CSS. If you view CSS, we have IDs and classes in CSS. We have the pound sign that we used on Tuesday for JavaScript. These share like a couple of tasks. So I'm going to click on this to go to some section with that ID. Make sure, of course, that those are spelled exactly the same, capital A, capital A. Save it and run it and try it. You should see a link. You should be able to click on it, and it should go to section two, page two. Let's see. So I see a simple link. Go to page two. I click. I'm in page two, which I have not done any of the effort of doing the upgrade with headers and footers and all of that cool stuff. So, and there's no back button or, or whatever, but you know I can press back. So uh, here I am on my back on my first section, page one, screen one. So jQuery Mobile, in short, is a way that we are upgrading a plain old HTML project to something more interesting. Right away, we were able to create a header, a footer, main content. Uh, line those things up and all of that. We'll be able to customize co colors and all of that as time goes on. Uh, so a very big reason why to use something like jQuery Mobile or other com competitors, other libraries, are that very quickly we can create something here. I could do this by myself from scratch and spend two whole days on it. And even though we've done it very slowly and deliberately, this can be accomplished very quickly in five minutes, ten minutes. Whereas if you were going to do what's going on behind the scenes manually, it would take you hours, if not days, especially at a different levels of experience. So this is a great starting point. It's, it's not cheating or anything like that. It's just a library. It's a tool for me to get started quickly. Nowadays, modern web and app design is a lot about using the right library to help me get started quickly. I don't want to have to uh, program myself every single time. How does this animation work? I use a library full of built-in animations. I attach the animation to my button. It's animated. I don't have to program that manually. Creating these different screens and hiding them and showing them with display block and display hidden and such. Too much work, too much effort. I just want to create my app. I, of course, want to customize it and set up proper graphics and alignment and colors and all of that, which we can and which we will later. Yes. Can you speak up just a little bit? We would not want to use target blank because this is not going to be a, a website. It's going to be an app. It's going to be an app that we want it to uh, eventually be on a device, and it's going to open different screens. We could set up a way that we can open external web links and such, but from our level of knowledge at the moment, target blank is not the best way to do it. So the pro, the positive about this is, look at what I created so quickly. This is our third day of class. This is our second day of more HTML. But if you've never done HTML before, this is very advanced compared to starting with completely from scratch level 0 HTML. The negative about this is page 2 still looks so simple. The negative is I have to manually then add the code necessary. It doesn't know then that every one of my screens will have a header, a footer, and a main content. And that's exactly what I've got here. When we created this section a while ago, it was nothing. And therefore, it looks like nothing because I haven't done header, I haven't done footer, I haven't done article. So that's a negative there. But one way that we can deal with that is copy and paste. If we've got one section looking well, header, main content footer, we can easily copy and paste that to be more screens. We'll do that in a moment, because I want to show you something else here as we continue to learn jQuery Mobile. 
this button doesn't look like a button. It looks like a classic link. You know, you hover over it's a classic link. With jQuery Mobile, we can upgrade it to actually look like a button. So let's do that first. We're going to add more attributes here. Line 33 or so, you've got your href to tell it where to go. Data role, button. Simply with that data role, go ahead and save it and run it and see what you get. Plain old link gets upgraded very, very fancy, very, very easily. Look at that. So I get a rollover effect. I put my mouse on it, it changes color, which we can, of course, edit later. We get a little drop shadow. Here's something that will get more oohs and ahs. Data-icon. We have 50 built-in icons into jQuery Mobile. And of course, we can create our own icon. But here's one, let's just say, star. Data-icon attribute. Make sure that you're adding these attributes inside of the A tag. I'm still inside the A tag. Data icon star adds a, a simple star to my button. I have these other ones. Camera, home, bars. That's not what you think. Bars is, is actually bars, not. Oops, not data roll. Icon, data roll. Button, there we go, sorry. Data icon, bars, camera, home. So it looks like that. What else? Uh, user. Again, there's 50 of them built in. You don't have to have them all memorized. It's very impressive to be able to name a few of them, though. We can, of course, go look them up at the website, which we will a little later. And we can make our own icons. Because even though we've got 50 of them built in, it doesn't have my company icon. Or it doesn't have, you know, an icon. It doesn't have, I don't think we've got one like of a little book. If this is a comic book app, I would like to have a little icon of a book or a comic. I don't think we have that. We have some arrows. Arrow dash R. We'll create an arrow pointing to the right. So I'm setting up ways, and we will see other ways to make clickable things. And this arrow might be useful. Next page, previous page. See what else we have? Carrot, not carrot, but carrot. Not carrot the vegetable, but carrot like the diamond, I guess. Twenty-four, not diamonds. Uh, the gold, twenty-four karat gold. Carrot R points to the right. If only there were somehow to point it to the left. Dash L. Dash L. So arrow L, carrot L. And there's, of course, caret u, or arrow u, or d, arrow d. So we've got several arrows. We've got some icons of basic operations, like cameras. So the camera icon, I always forget this one. It's either mail or email. Let me try mail first. Yeah, it's mail. M-A-I-L, mail. OK, now I've got an icon so that it looks like I can send an email. Obviously, it won't send an email. It's not programmed to do that at all. But if I then program it to send emails and I use the mail icon, it looks like what it's supposed to be, and it does what it's supposed to do. And that's all because of data icon. jQuery Mobile gives us a shortcut. We'd have to make our own icon in Photoshop or whatever, and then put it in here as a GIF or a ping or something, and then put it in here. It's too big. Resize it with CSS. It's all built in. And the project is responsive, so we're not there yet. But if you have it maximized like, like a tablet, eventually we will have a side panel. You know, if this is wide like a tablet, it's, it's got a lot of empty space. 
we're going to be able to make a grid system so that when we're maximized like this, it's responsive and, it, and we get a side panel. And then when we're smaller, like a, like a tall mobile device like this, the side panel will go away and only show the main content. Uh, all of that is built into jQuery Mobile. We just need to read the documentation, practice with it. And again, this is, as I said before, you don't need to know all 200 raw HTML codes. You don't need to know all 200 CSS or or, or uh, raw JavaScript codes. And jQuery Mobile has its own 100 or whatever shortcuts, data role, data icon, data transition, etc. You don't have to have them all memorized. You just need to know the ones that are important for your project, and you need to know how to look up uh, what else you need. Here's another thing. Data role, data icon, data transition. This one might not be as impressive as it could be yet. Data transition is the way that we then set animations. It's very subtle, but do you notice as you go from page 1 to page 2, the content fades. It doesn't just suddenly appear. It's very subtle. You might not have noticed it, but as you go from one screen to another, there's a little bit of a fade. So we have a data transition. The default one is fade. That's redundant other ones. Flip. Make the screen flip as you go from one to the other. There's about six of them built in and we can program our own, although that's a little harder. Just like with the icons, there's 50 built in and we can program our own. There's six built in transitions. Here's one of them. Flip. And what happens is you're on page one, you click, the screen flips, you go back, it flips back. You see it a little better when you come back to page one because there's more content to see. There's not much to look at on page two, but when you go back, the cool thing about this also is that when you go back, it automatically then animates the opposite direction. Fade in, fade out. Flip forward, flip back. We've also got slide. The screen will slide into view in one direction, and when you come back, it slides back in the opposite direction. the screen slid over. When I press back, it slides back. another one called flow that one's hard to describe it's I think one of the most extravagant ones it's really interesting try flow and see what that one looks like again it's more impressive when there is content on page two to look at but flow what happens with this one is you tap it and it's like the screen slides out of the way and then slides back All of this is happening because of those three, uh, those three libraries. Watch this. If I break the connection between those three files we set up, the project goes back to that. Without the connection to the jQuery mobile files and the jQuery file, we get a plain old project that when those are active, we get the interface design, the different screens, the animation, the icons, shortcuts. All of that is still the original code that we wrote, and when we connect to these files, we then get upgraded. OK. Page 2, let's address what's going on with page 2. There's nothing interesting there. As I said, one of the downsides of jQuery Mobile is that it does not then automatically trickle down and apply itself everywhere in your project. If 
you have seven screens, all seven of those screens are going to need the same syntax as we've done here. They're all going to need a section, header, article, footer. What's in, inside of these things is, is then going to change up to you. So I, I want to make my about screen better than it currently is. Uh, I'm going to delete that one that's there. It's way too simple. And I'm going to copy everything that section to section was, and then I have to change it. So your page two section, it would be more effort to try to add header and article and roll and blah, blah, blah. It's going to be a lot easier since this page is relatively complete we can just reuse section 1 PG home we can use it for for the about screen of course what we need to do here is what did I say about using the same ID more than once don't so when we copied PG home to take over for PG home for page 2 make sure that your copy now then says PG home or PG about And then this is going to be changed. Page 2, main content of page 2, footer of page 2. I'm just changing it visually. This is stuff that's going to show up to the user, to you as you test it. But if you copied the first section to use it as a sort of template, for the second section, the main thing that needs to be changed is the ID. So try that, save it and run it, and see, and see a new page two. It has its header, it has its article, it has its footer. So I'm looking at page one, I click go to page two, and I'm on page two. It says page two there, go to page two. Well, I'm already on page two, so nothing really happens. You should probably, for practice, change that, go back to page one. If I'm on page two, this button that takes me to page two, again, is redundant. So change that. You should be able to figure out, change the button on page two to take you back to page one. So if you, make, if you make that change, I'm on page one, I click go to page two, I'm on page two, I change the button to say go back to page one, and when you click on that, it goes back to page one. Let's, uh, let's do something here that'll be more important as time goes on. Right now I've got page one. Um, let's change that. I, it's too sterile, page one. This is our home screen. Then page two will be our about screen. So in, uh, internally, one is called PG about and one is called PG home. But to the user, it's very sterile, page one, page two. So obviously then what the user needs to see is different than what we need to see behind the scenes. 
So in our first section, PG Home, at the very top there, it's no longer page one. We can call it you know, Home. Person will see that. Main content, we'll change that a, a little bit later. Um, footer of PG Home. Uh, let's do something like copyright 2018, your name, your company. You can become an app developer the moment you write it out. You don't have to go through you know, City Hall or whatever to get a real license as a real app developer. <coughs> you say you're, you know, you're Campos Apps LLC, and yes, you are. Well, you, know, you, you are an app developer as soon as you choose to become one. You, you don't really have to get any certification or anything like that. You have to get the knowledge, of course. But let's say here, whatever, whatever copyright you want to put at the bottom, your name, you make up a company, whatever. So Jones App Co., whatever. Just putting something down on the footer, copyright. The, um, the thing, of course, that happens, like I said, uh, one, the downside, it, it does not automatically change on the different screens. Uh, when I'm on page one, there I see home, and I see the footer, copyright. And when I go to page two, it doesn't know to put the footer there, the copyright. So that, that's a downside there. But if you have already the plan, and right now we're, we're not quite at the point of developing our plan of what our app will ultimately be, we're kind of getting the pieces of the puzzle. We will, of course, have a time when we actually go through the real process of, well, we need to brainstorm the app. What are the screens going to look like? What's it going to behave like? We'll do that app wireframing and such, of course, eventually. But as you figure out, well, I need a screen that has this and has that, then, OK, well, every screen's going to have this copyright. So I'm going to know to put it uh, to copy and paste it into every screen or whatever. And there are going to be ways, of course, to dynamically change all of this dynamically via JavaScript. Right now, we're only focusing on HTML. So there is a way via JavaScript, of course, for the footer to automatically change, you know, to have today's weather or to show you who is currently logged in or at the top it to automatically say, welcome, John, depending who's logged in. Of course, we can do all of that. At this point, it's just HTML. When we get to JavaScript, we integrate this plus JavaScript, and then it'll have a much more functional uh, interactive app. It's just that at the moment, we have to manually copy and paste that copyright line, and then put it down on section two. So now I've got the copyright on both sections. And then on page two, well, I don't want it to say page two at the top. I want it to say about. I'm in the about screen. So in PG about, I'm usually going to refer to these screens, these sections, by their ID. PG about, PG home, PG save comic, PG log out. Whatever the section's unique ID is, is a good way to refer to it. In PG about, at the top, this will say about. This is the about screen of the app. Whenever you see copyrights, what do you see besides what we've got here? <clears throat> the copyright symbol. So obviously, one quick way to do it is just to put C in copyrights. One amateur way to do it is that way. One real way to do it is to write the copyright HTML code. So ampersand, copy, semicolon. That's all one word, no spaces with the semicolon. That will convert into a copyright symbol. That looks more professional. So I see the copyright symbol. <clears throat> I wrote it in page two, so I have to also have it back on page one. That'd be a good note right here. 
HTML character entity. And copy semicolon becomes copyright symbol. I can go, of course, online and look up list of HTML character entities and look up, well, how do I write the trademark symbol? How do I write the euro symbol? How do I write the yen symbol? How do I write accent marks? Well, because we set up UTF-8 character set a long time ago, yesterday, when we set up character set UTF-8, that was part of the purpose to be able to access all of these alphabets, all of these symbols, such as copyright symbol. Question? No. So we've got these other ones such as and uh, yen semicolon that will create the yen symbol. And right, I'm just kind of throwing them in there. Doesn't make sense to put it there, but just to show it. So the yen symbol. There's uh, and uh, euro. It's the euro symbol. Let's say we wanted to write ole, accent mark on the e. We can do ampersand e acute semicolon. That's going to create the the e with an accent mark. Ampersand E acute semicolon creates an accented E. So I could write O L <coughs> and then acute E. And I get Ole. <coughs> We've also got a bunch of symbols, you know, emoji and such. But just here's one off the top of my head. Ampersand hearts creates a heart. That one is just easy to remember because we've got hearts, spades, clubs, and diamonds from uh, you know playing cards, from poker cards. So we can go look up. A bunch of them, and I would recommend that at some point go look up at, at some point HTML character entities. And you'll see a list of like 50,000 of them because there's a lot of these special symbols. There's math symbols, there's letters in Greek or Japanese, um, there's all of these little icons. Very commonly used and uncommonly used symbols because we've had, we've we've set up our character set as UTF-8. We have access to like I don't know like thirty-two thousand characters or something. Now all of this that I was doing in the footer was on page two. It's not on page one. So just something to be aware of.